Bechorda. So you may or may not know that today is International Women's Day. So the theme for this International Women's Day in 2021 is Choose to Challenge. So a challenged world is an alert world and from challenge comes change. So let's all choose to challenge. So the history of International Women's Day is that it has occurred for well over a century. So it's been going on for well over a century with the first gathering held in 1911. Okay, and the colors that symbolize International Women's Day are those of the suffrage movement as well. So purple, green and white are the colors of International Women's Day. Purple signifies justice and dignity. Green symbolizes hope. White represents purity. Uh, and so the colors originated from the Women's Social and Political Union, WSPU, as I said, with the suffrage movement in the UK in 1908. So International Women's Day is not a country, it's not a group, it's not an organization, it's not a government, it's not a charity, it's not anything like that. The day belongs to all groups collectively everywhere. Gloria Steinem, world-renowned feminist journalist and activist, once explained the story of women's struggle for equality belongs to no single feminist, nor to any one organization, but to the collective efforts of all who care about human rights. So make International Women's Day your day and do what you can to truly make a positive difference for women. But do we still need an International Women's Day in 2021? You know, really? Yes, we do. There's no place for complacency. Complacency means that we kind of get used to it, get kind of forget about it. We don't, shouldn't be doing that because there's still a lot of gender in parity, especially when it comes to pay and to work for women. It, there is still a huge difference. So raise your hand high to show that you're in and that you commit and choose to challenge and call out equality. There's urgent work to do and we can all play a part. I think it's so important to celebrate International Women's Day. We can't sit back and forget about equality and think that somebody else is going to do it for us. It's not a case that it's men against women or anything like that. It's trying to change an age old system to represent the truth and what is obvious to us all. International Women's Day isn't just for people like me, it's about all of us. It's a reminder for us that we're not really there yet. We need to, as humans, support those from different backgrounds, those who've been discriminated against because of who they are, who they feel they are on the inside, who they love or what they look like. There's no equality until we're all equal. We're very lucky in Ireland to have come so far, but we still have a long way to go. It doesn't matter what age you are, who you are or where you're from, never accept anything less than equality. Don't dare let anyone ever call you bossy, Correct them and tell them that you're determined and that you're a leader. Speak your mind. It's not a case that girls should be seen and not heard. You should be seen, heard and listened to. And I know from teaching girls in school that our future at Thishi can be women and that they will make decisions that will change this country, that they will listen to those who are vulnerable and give them voices. I mean, look at Kamala Harris, look at Jacinta Ardern. Women who are leading countries, standing by their principles and making a change. As Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, women belong in all places where decisions are being made. So choose to challenge. We are back with the animation geniuses at the Kilkenny based Cartoon Saloon. I adore these guys work. Today we're meeting Maria, one of the production designers on the Oscar nominated cartoon Wolf Walkers. Now I have seen Wolf Walkers and trust me, it is wild. Hello, my name is Maria Pareja and I was working as a production designer and scene illustration on Wolf Walkers. So well, we're gonna draw a little piece of a forest background uh, so we can see how we were developing the style uh, in the movie and how we make it match with the characters. First of all, we are going to have our little character always next to our scene so we can match the details and the elements around the character. But we're going to start doing some flowers here. So for example, uh, some types of flowers that we've been doing for the movie are like the typical flowers, but for our movie we needed to do something a little bit more rough in order to match with the characters, so we would do all the elements like several times, so it looks a little bit more energetic. 
and it doesn't need to be perfect because this has a lot more energy and it will fit better in the same world of Maeve and the rest of our characters. So we can have a lot of different type of plants. We've been doing a lot of research and walks around the forest here in Kilkenny to see the different plants that we can find. We're gonna draw some trees now. So, uh, for example, uh, we're gonna start doing a tree. And we don't want the tree to be perfectly straight. We want the tree to have like nice energy. So we're gonna pass the pencil a few times on top of the tree. And then I like to have also a not so sharp pencil for the rough lines. So we can like play with different textures with the side of the pencil and have different darkness on the line. We have to remember that our character has to be close to the tree, so it has to match a little bit the character. And the branches has to have also the same flow of the tree. Get some roots. The empty space between things to add more details and create some patterns. So we can take some of the type of leaves that we were doing before and put them inside of the space. And then we're going to check with our character. And we can perfectly imagine our little Maeve walking around next to this little piece of forest. And hope you guys liked it. Give it a try and please show us what you do. Hi there, so my name is Neve and I'm a scientist and I love all things space and I have devoted my life to see if I can get to space and share all my stories with you. And where it all began? Well, I think it began when I was around eight years old and we were on our summer holidays, stuck at home like you are now. And my dad sent us some homework and he said, I want you to write about your favorite planet. So at the time mine was Saturn because it had the rings. But the great thing was I started looking at pictures and I saw this amazing picture of the earth from far away as if I was standing on the moon. I'd never seen it like that before. There was these kind of white stripes and I realized that they were the clouds and then there was blue bits and then I realized that that was the ocean and then there was kind of green and brown bits and then I realized they were countries and I couldn't believe what I was looking at and I would just stare at it. And of course, that was the first selfie because every single person that ever existed on our planet was in that photograph with the exception of the three people on the spacecraft taking that photograph. And that was it. When I saw that picture, I said, one day I am going to stand on the moon and I'm going to see the earth from far, far away. And that's where my dream began. I knew what I wanted to be when I was eight years old. In my house, nobody ever said anything about what you can and cannot do, whether you're a boy or a girl. It was about what was possible. So when I was your age, I wanted to do it. And I had absolutely no doubt whatsoever that I was going to achieve it. So I always wrote, I loved writing. I've always kept diaries. So this is a diary of when I was, I think I was 11 or 12 and actually, Yesterday, uh, in 1981, I made my confirmation. So I have it here in my diary. And here is another one, um, the next year. And I was very good that particular year because I actually completed all of my diary entries that year. And then I have all my homework notebooks. I hope you have a homework notebook. So I would keep track of the homework that I would have to do every day. And then I'd put a tick beside it. So I always loved keeping track of the things that I would do every day and writing them down and logging them, even my homework. So I was always writing and here in my autograph book as well, I would pretend that I was a nuclear scientist, you see here, and I have the word laboratory, which was really interesting. And then I have my science book, which I absolutely loved. And I have kept every single lab book ever since. And if I open it up to you, look how long I would spend drawing my experiments and then writing them up in that way. I cannot tell you how much I loved this book. 
And I even have here some of my test results and I got 94%. Oh yeah, I was always a really good student in science. Loved it, absolutely loved it. So writing was always a part of me. So the hardest thing was telling everybody that I wanted to go to space. So that was the first thing. And the really interesting thing was because I love space and science so much, lots of people just were delighted to hear me say it and they really wanted to help me. They said, we'll help you, what can we do? So years and years and years later, I went to visit Black Rock Castle Observatory in Cork and they said, we want to help you. And so they introduced me to all the people that they knew working at the European Space Agency. Then I got a scholarship, so I got given money by the European Space Agency to go on an amazing course called the Space Studies Program in America. And I met loads of people, lots of people who wanted to go to space just like me, teachers and scientists, astronauts. I met loads of astronauts. And suddenly I saw a path. So when I was 15 and 16 and I couldn't meet anybody who was able to help me get to space, now I was in a room full of people who made my dream totally normal. And then I got invited to take part in this mission in the middle of the desert in America as if I was on Mars. So for over two weeks, I lived as if I was on Mars on a mission called a simulated Mars mission the Mars Desert Research Station. And we lived as if we were on Mars. So, take a breath in and breathe out. We can do that really easily on Earth, right? Not so easy on Mars, because you know why? There's no oxygen on Mars. There's carbon dioxide. So if you were to go outside and breathe in, you go, <coughs> So what do you have to do? Yeah, you have to wear a spacesuit and a helmet. So every time we went outside, we put on our spacesuits. And we would go outside on missions or spacewalks, or they're also known as EVAs. And we would go out to collect samples because some of the people that I was with, they were people that specialized in studying the rocks of Mars, it's called geology. And people that were interested in, if there's any life on Mars, they're called astrobiologists. And they had to go outside and collect samples. It was an actual science experiment. So every day we had something to do. It's actually very similar to the way we are living now because of this virus. We had to have a schedule and we had to stick to it every day. And we had to work together and we had to tell each other what we were going to be doing every day. And then if we wanted to go outside on our space walks or also known as EVAs, we had to ask mission control, which were miles and miles and miles away and say, can we please go outside? And they would say, yes, you can go outside. Why do you want to go outside? What do you want to do when you go outside? And we tell them, well, we want to collect examples. And then we would have to have reports in every day before nine o'clock. We had two hours every day to send our reports in. And I took photographs and I took loads of movies and I wrote about it. And that's what I did. And I learned that I'm really good at being able to talk about space and sharing stories. And after that mission ended, I realized, that's it, that's how I'm gonna to get to space. I'm gonna write stories, I'm gonna take pictures, I'm gonna make videos, I'm gonna to talk to people, and I'm going to share every single moment of my experiences, and I'm gonna be so good at it, somebody is gonna send me to space to do it. In drama, we are going to be looking at shadow puppetry. Have you ever tried it? You can even do some with your hand and with a torch and make different little animals. You could do little bunnies. But I am going to be telling you all about Lotte Reiniger, the female pioneer of shadow puppetry. But we'll meet her later. First, let's get building our theatre and our puppet. First, we're going to make our little theatre screen. So we need card or cardboard or something that will stay standing, okay? So first I'm going to take this shoe box, but remember, as long as you can make it stand up, it doesn't matter. So I'm gonna take this shoe box and I'm going to take the lid off it. So I'm just gonna cut the lid off it because I don't need the rest of it. Now, Okay, so I'll leave that to the side. I don't actually need that for a while. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a pencil or a pen. So I'm gonna use this color because you'll be able to see it. And I'm going to cut out the space 
for a screen, okay? So I'm gonna make a rough mark where I'm going to cut. So it's kind of, kind of going to look like a cinema screen. And I know we can't go to the cinema at the moment, so why not make our own one at home? So you stick your scissors through and mind your fingers, and then I'm gonna start cutting. I'm gonna keep this actually to make a little stand for it. So here is our screen. So what we need to do now is put some paper here, some tracing paper or some baking paper, the type of thing that you might use to cook cookies so they don't stick to the tray. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll them out and I'm gonna place my screen down. And then I am going to use my screen to trace how much paper I need. But it's gonna be pretty hard to stick it like that, so I'm gonna put an extra bit the whole way around it, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut it, cut this piece because baking paper is a little bit disobedient and will roll back up instantly on me. So I'm just gonna put that aside. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to, like I said, leave a little bit of space around the lines that I have drawn. So can you see the lines that I've drawn? So I need to leave space around them so that I'm able to stick it on the inside of my screen. So up we go. And I'm cutting nice and carefully, making sure my fingers aren't in the way. So I'm gonna put yeah, some glue. Actually, best thing to do is I'm gonna put some glue on the inside of my frame, okay? So this is the outside of my screen. This is the inside, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to glue the perimeter so that then I can just stick the baking paper down. Now, baking paper is ready to be stuck down. So here we go. Now, and just pat it down like that. We'll just leave it to dry then, okay? So can you see we have a screen made and you can't, you can kind of see through it very, very slightly, but that's why we're gonna use a torch later. So that's our screen done. Now, let's get started on our puppet. Okay, so I want my shadow puppet to be nice and stiff and standing up straight on me, not flopping around. So I'm going to use some card paper and I'm actually going to double over the card paper so that it stands up uh, without having needing to be propped up too much. It just makes my life easier. So I'm gonna glue this card like this. I'm gonna make sure it goes all over. Nice, messy glue. Okay, sticking it down. There we go. Next, time to do our puppet. Okay, for the purposes of this, I am going to do an outline of a woman. And you'll see why later, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna do the forehead like that. Remember, it doesn't really matter because uh, even if you make a mistake, because we won't see these lines anyway. And I'm gonna do the mouth, the chin, the throat, her hair, coming down like that. We're gonna give her a bun in her hair. And we're going to do the neck. And then we're going to give her a kind of a blousy thing so we can tell that she's wearing clothing. Now, so that's really simple outline. All you have to do is do a side profile and then we know it's a person. It would be kind of hard to do it head on because you can't tell what the person's facial features are, you might not even be able to tell it's a person, okay? So, I am going to cut this out first. Great, and there is our outline, okay? Now, what I want to do is I want to be able to make her speak, okay? So I am going to cut off her jaw, Snip. And I am going to draw 
a slightly longer jaw on this piece of paper, okay? So I'm going to take her outline and I'm just going to do where I think the jaw should be. Okay, something like that, okay? So I'm going to do her jaw. So imagine that you want to take her jaw bone, the bottom of her jaw bone, okay? And you'll see what I'm doing. I'm not being cruel, I promise. Now, so I'm going to cut that out, cut out her jaw. Okay, now, can you see what I'm doing now? So what I want to do, beg pardon, is I want to be able to make her speak, okay? So we'll open up her mouth actually slightly more so that we can kind of nearly make her look like she's smiling. So here we go. We have her jaw made, so her jaw is actually separate from her, okay? For the time being, because I want to be able to make her speak just like this, do you see? So what I'm going to do next is I am going to use a butterfly clip. So if you don't have a butterfly clip at home, it doesn't matter. You could use a staple as long as it was loose or even a piece of string or whatever you can find at home that might help you to be able to move the jaw. So I'm going to show you what I'm doing. So I am going to put a spot here to show where I want to hinge the jaw. So because look, my jaw is on a hinge itself. It's like, okay. So I'm going to hinge the jaw here and make a little spot there as well. I'm going to make a small hole with the scissors and I'm going to be very careful. And then a little hole there as well. So that one's quite tricky. You definitely would need an adult to help you do that piece. So I'm going to take a butterfly clip and I am going to stick it through the little hole that I made. Do you see what I mean? Okay. And then I'm going to stick the jaw through that too. The little jaw bone. Oopsie daisy. There we have it. And then I'm going to open up the butterfly clip like such. So that then it makes a joint. So you can see how you could use a staple if it was loose or even making a little hole and putting a piece of thread through it and tying it on either side. This gives her a lovely little jaw. Okay? Now, what I need to do is I am going to make a little um, control kind of stick, okay? So I'm going to cut a piece of this plant, uh, but if you have like a chopstick or a little sticker, whatever you have at home yourself, it really doesn't matter. So I'm just going to take a small portion of this. It's easier if it's whatever it is, it's kind of stiff so that you can use it to control the puppet. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to stick this little stick onto her jaw so that I can then control her using this stick alone, okay? So I'm gonna just use a little bit of glue like this and I'm gonna stick it onto the jaw like so and then I would wait for it to dry, okay? So you can see that I have my little stick on the inside there and when I pull on that I can make her open and close her jaw which looks like she's talking, okay? And then on the other side it's just like this so that I can hide my hand in where the stick is and move her jaw. So that is how we make a puppet, that is how we make a screen. Okay, now it's time for me to put on my very own shadow puppet for you. Okay, so I'm going to use a puppet and a screen that I made earlier myself so it's dry so that we can keep going with it. So just bear with me a moment and I'm going to clear the stage. So here is a screen that I made earlier and it's all dry so it's ready to go. You can see that I kind of put these like kind of wings on it I made kind of scaling triangles so that helps prop it up keep it at a slight angle um, and it helps it stay steady okay so what I'm going to do is I'm going to place my little stage up here my little screen for my puppet okay and I have a puppet 
that I made earlier on who's ready to go so it's all dried so that I can put on a little puppet show for you okay now I'm going to use the torch on my phone it doesn't matter what kind of torch you use at home whatever you have I'm just going to use the one on the phone because it's the handiest okay so I am going to get my puppet ready and then we are going to switch off the lights and I'm going to let you meet a very special person. I'm going to let you meet Lotte Reiniger. I'm going to let Lotte tell you her story and you'll learn about just how important her role in the history of film was. Okay, off we go. Hello, wie geht's? Ich heiße Lotte Reiniger. Hello, how are you? My name is Lotte Reiniger. I was born in Berlin in Germany on June 2nd, 1899. As a child, I loved Chinese silhouette puppetry. I made my very own theater just like this and I did shows for my family and friends. When I was a teenager, I loved cinema and anything to do with film. I went to lots of talks and lectures about special effects. And I was noticed for my silhouette portraits. Silhouette means your outline. Silhouette portraits were very popular back then. I was asked then to do title cards for films. This means that I would write the opening or the closing credits who tell you who is in the film. In 1918, I animated Wooden Rats for Die Rattenfänger von Hamlin, also known as the Pied Piper of Hamlin. I was then asked to work in an animation studio. Here I met my husband, Karl Koch. I made the longest surviving animated film called Die Geschichte des Prinzen Ahmed, The Adventures of Prince Ahmed in 1926. It was a huge success. I invented the multiplane camera long before Walt Disney did. The multiplane camera means that you had a layer for your background, your foreground, and then another layer for your characters. This is something that is very common now in animation, and I was the one to invent it. Although not many people know that. Because of the success of Prince Ahmed, I made lots more films. Why not look them up and see for yourselves? Lots of them are on YouTube. During the Second World War, myself and Karl tried to leave Berlin because the Nazi party was on the rise but we couldn't get a visa to stay in another country. So, unfortunately, we were forced to stay in Berlin. In 1949, after the Second World War was over, we finally were able to move and we moved to London in England. We lived there for nearly 20 years. Carl died in 1962. But I made 20 more animated movies, mostly based on fairy tales. I died in Germany in 1981 at the age of 82. What a life I lived. Now, so there you have it. We learned how to make a stage and screen for shadow puppetry and how to make a shadow puppet. I hope you enjoyed learning all about Lotte Reiniger and her invaluable contribution to film and animation. Why not make another shadow puppet at home of a character or an important person in history or somebody who inspires you?
Hi everybody, my name is uh, Senator Eileen Flynn and I'm a traveller woman here to uh, speak uh, to you all today. Could I call on Senator Eileen Flynn? Over 30 years, Travellers has bought it to be around the political table, and it's brilliant now that there's finally a voice in the Senate Aaron for a member of the Traveller community, but also that unique voice, a voice in the Senate for those at the very end of Irish society. I'm um, the first uh, Traveller to ever be in the House of the Rockers the doll or the Shannet. Now, I, I'm a senator, which means I'm in the Shannet, and my role is to implement uh, legislation and to educate people, and to educate especially our future, our young people, around uh, uh, the traveller community, but also around being, you know, nice to each other and to learn from, uh, from, from each other. So I look very forward to being that voice for those at the end of society. Being a traveller is that you come from an ethnic minority group. Uh, we uh, speak our own language, uh, can't. A lot of traveller people are very religious, a very uh, close uh, net community, and the value of, of, of family and traditions from, that's built up over hundreds of years. I grew up in a halting site in Valley Farms. Always been out outside in the hail, rain and snow. Um, didn't have much uh, technology growing up as, as, as a child. And, you know, looking back at that now, it was a lovely way of life. And even still today, living on a halting site brings that sense of freedom to, to children where, you know, they're always out playing, always out kind of communicating with each other. A lot of people hear bad stories about uh, travellers and sometimes we can get caught up in the, the negative uh, stuff but there's more positive uh, stories about the traveller community and when I talk about the positive, like when I, had, when I hung around with 14 settled uh, children in Bally Farmer going back as a, as a young woman myself, you know, we had more in common, there were more that brought us together than what separated us. I think it's about really getting to know individuals within your classrooms, within your community, because not every single traveller is, is a bad person, you know, because there's an awful lot of good people within uh, the traveller community. Like, I have a little girl, Billy, and she's 16 months, and I hope that she'll go on to school in Donegal and make friends from, from all communities. And, you know, again, it comes right back to, to not judge, judging each other and to, to make friends with people who are not from your community. I lost my mother at um, 10 years of age. And nine days after my mother died, I was in a really bad car crash. I was in Our Lady's Hospital for a num number of months. And, you know, you're not okay when you lose, especially your uh, mother or your father. And I, th I think for young people, there's always somebody to speak to, let that be an uncle, an auntie, uh, an, a younger brother or sister or older. And it's, it's important that we talk about how we feel, you know? And for me, I was never ashamed in speaking how I felt after I lost my mother. And still now, after 21 years, I still think about her every day and when I was 11 I would have got counselling and again I don't think it's any harm for young people if you're you know sometimes if you feel down or if you feel sad that it's okay to say it to somebody and to speak to a counsellor and I think it's very important that that we that we're able to express our uh, feelings let that be even through song through art and, and again, speaking, speaking to your friends. And sometimes, sometimes your friends are probably feeling some way sad as well. And I think it's really important for young people, and even at 11, to be able to be open about their feelings. In Ireland, we have our own humanitarian crisis, and that's the living conditions that the traveller community are living in today in 21st century Ireland. Now is a time for action. Some people think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm crazy and that things are never going to change. And some people have hope that things will change, that getting the seat is a starting point to, to, to change, you know? 
15 years ago, you know, I didn't want to accept the fact that I was a member of the Traveller community. I was told so much that we were such a bad people that I started to believe that we were bad people. And I think that can go for anybody that's watching the show that, you know, if you're told that, like, I, when I went to school, I was told I had dyslexia. And again, I felt, oh, so I, am I silly? Am I stupid because I have dyslexia? Actually, no, it's just different ways of, of, of learning. And it's the same way that from a community that you're from, you do things differently. And it's actually, it's quite cool to be different and, 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 and be the person you are. So I look forward to working with everybody and hopefully we can all learn from each other and hopefully that I'll be that person that will break down the barriers for traveller people and also for those at the end of our society. Thank you. Never in the history of the state have we had anybody from the traveller community in the House of the Oireachtas and getting the seat was that one difference. I'm hoping to bring around hate crime legislation and if we were to have a good hate crime legislation, uh, legislation in Ireland, well then people will have to think twice before they're nasty uh, to individuals because of the colour of their skin, because of their ability, because of, because of who they are. My name's Robin, I'm nine, I do my dress. And there's not enough room in my house to practice, so I have to come out here to practice. My dress gave me loads of confidence, so I'm not shy. I've won loads of competitions, and I came first place in almost all of them. All my cousins and all my friends do my dress, and we have a great time. Hi, my name is Ashley, and I'm a children's nurse at Children Health Ireland in Crumlin. And you might have known us as Our Ladies Children's Hospital in Crumlin but now all the children's hospitals have come together as one good team. And we're called Children's Health Ireland because people from all over the country come to the hospital to get help and to make themselves good and healthy again. I began nursing at a very young age. So when I was in school, like yourselves in primary school, I loved to help people. I always loved to help my classmates and I also loved to help out at home. I have an auntie called Fiona, and Fiona has a condition called cerebral palsy, or CP for short. So with this, Fiona's right side of her body just doesn't work as well as her left side of her body. So she needs help with walking, and when I was a child, maybe as young as you, or maybe even younger, I used to help. And this showed me that I loved helping people and caring for others who needed help. So when I went into transition year at the age of 16, my mommy and I were talking and she thought, actually, I think you'd make a good nurse. So I decided to do a one week work experience in my local hospital. And surprise, surprise, I loved it. And that made me want to become a nurse even more. So I decided I want to become a children's nurse because children are fantastic. They're resilient and they're so much fun. And now that's where I work in St. Michael's Ward in the children's hospital. At the moment, in the hospital, you're only allowed to have one visitor with you, and this can be a parent or a guardian. And this is because we have strict visiting rules. So you might not be able to come in, but I will. Please wash your hands, because it's really important, especially when this virus is around. I know it's super hard not being in school and not seeing all your friends, but you're doing a great job by staying at home and it's really helping me and it's keeping me safe and it's keeping you safe. When I arrive into work, I hear about all the patients who are in with us and we hear about what they need and why they're here and what we need to do to make them get better. We get everyone started ready for the day. So we get up and we get ready. And then we might have a few tests done and the doctors come. And then maybe if it's a weekday, we might have a bit of school. So the school here in Crumlin is still going on, but we do it virtually, kind of like you're doing here at home. So the teachers will talk to the patients through their iPad maybe, or on their phone. And they do all their fun subjects that they usually do at school. But they're also really lucky. They get to watch this fantastic program too. So I want to say hello and thanks to all the Moon Tours, Moon Tour Ray, Moon Tour John and Moon Tour Kalina. Hey,
and all the boys and girls here in Crumlin have been watching the programme too, just like you at home. So being a nurse, it's so much fun and it really is a privilege because we're so lucky here that we get to see people grow up. Now, I'm only a nurse for a short time, so I've only seen children growing for a little over a year. But my older nurses that I work with have seen children growing from being a toddler all the way up to being a teenager because we get children coming in throughout their whole childhood. And this is fantastic because we get to really get to know them and we get to know their families and we get to know everything about them, which is so good. And they get to know us too. We're almost like a little family. And we get to take care of them and we see them get better, which is just fantastic. Imelda, our specialist nurse. Hi, my name is Imelda and I'm the clinical nurse specialist in haemophilia. This is our occupational therapist. Hi, my name is Cathy, I'm one of the occupational therapists in Crumlin. And this is one of our physiotherapists. Hi, my name is Isa, and I'm a physiotherapist. Hi, I'm Sinead. Hi, I'm Elaine. So since being a nurse, I've been lucky enough to have lots of boys and girls work with me. It's not just for girls. So everyone can be a nurse, even you at home if you want to be. Hello to all our patients on St. Michael's Ward. I have a challenge for you today. Can you name three Irish female scientists? If so, great, well done. But if not, let's see if we can do something about that. We're about to have a quick look at three Irish scientists who changed the world we live in today. But first, do you know what the word stereotype means? It means it's an overused belief about a group of people and a lot of the times it's not true. In this case, we're looking at stereotypes about girls and women in science. And if you're a boy watching this and you're thinking, well, this doesn't really apply to me, of course it does. If you have a mother or a sister or a cousin or a friend who's a girl, you want them to have the same right to choose whatever they want to do too. And some people might think that technology, science and maths are more suited to boys or that girls are more suited to languages and working with children, but we all know that's not true, don't we? Our gender doesn't decide what we're good at and what we're passionate about, that comes from our heart. Did you know that 30%, that's three out of 10 girls, have chosen to study home economics in secondary school, while only one in six chose to study engineering? Why do you think that is? This is a problem because lots of the higher paid jobs in Ireland are in engineering and technology. So that means that women don't have access to these jobs. And this is contributing to women earning less than men across the board. And we all know that that's not fair. What we need are role models and fabulous women to look up to. It's like they say, you can't be what you can't see. So let's start changing that and have a look at three special Irish women in science. Of course, there's loads of fabulous and wonderful intelligent Irish women in science, but we're going to have a look at three of them today. If you want to learn more about Irish women in science and Irish female trailblazers, then go onto herstory.ie, a fabulous website dedicated to bringing forgotten Irish women back into the light. Let's begin. Now, our first wonderful woman in science is a woman called Kathleen Yardley. She was born in County Kildare in 1903 and she had nine brothers and sisters. She had a really hard childhood because her family were really poor and then her parents separated. Her mother brought herself and her remaining siblings to Essex in England. She was really intelligent and did super well in school. She chose to study physics because she was worried that if she did maths, that she would have to study to be a maths teacher because teaching was the only career that a female maths graduate could have at that time. She received the highest marks in the University of London in 10 years. And so she was invited to the research school of a Nobel physicist. She was the only woman in the group of international researchers. She also received 180 pounds per year which was a lot at that time, so she could afford to help her family out. 
She married a man called Thomas Lonsdale when she was 24 years old, and he was really supportive of her dreams and her career, which is so important. She made lots of valuable discoveries about real and synthetic diamonds. And she was a pioneer, that means one of the first, in the study of crystal structures. She had two children, and so then she had to continue her research at home until the Nobel physicist that she had worked for created a special job for her at the Royal Institution. She became one of the first two women to be chosen as a fellow of the Royal Society. She was also the first woman professor at University College London. What a privilege. She was also the first female president of the International Union of Crystallography. My goodness. She was also a pacifist, and pacifist means that you don't believe in violence and war. And then she became president of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. She really strongly believed that women should work in science and fought her whole life to make a difference for all of us living today. Can you imagine how many firsts she had? What a wonderful woman. Now, the next woman in science we are going to meet is Shikemi Danuga, who is currently a student of medicinal chemistry and chemical biology. She's a woman in science today, so let's learn all about her. She is 20 years old and she's Nigerian Irish. She said that she was really curious when she was younger. However, she tells us that she didn't have a role model, but that her dad believed so passionately in education. And then she started believing in education herself. She had a passion for science, and in her secondary school, Kolosh de Vriza in Clondalkin in County Dublin, she was involved with the Young Social Innovators Community Programme. With a group of other young people, she helped to develop a breaking boundary scheme with the aim of changing perceptions, promoting unity, and making connections within our community. They had beautiful ideas, such as Positive Day, and wrote encouraging post-its on every locker in the school. She excelled in school, she did so well, even though she wasn't always sure about herself. When she was nearly finished with secondary school, she chose a common entry science course, which meant that she could explore all the different branches of science before choosing one to specialize in, showing us how important it is not to box ourselves in. It was here that she met her first true role model in chemistry, a teaching assistant named Lola. She said, it may not seem like much, but she was the first black female scientist I had ever met. And for the first time, I could see myself in someone else doing what I love. She continues her education and she is an inspirational role model for us all. Now, the last woman we're going to discuss today is Dr. Evan Bird. Her dad was an electrical engineer and she was interested in how things worked, even when she was young, even trying to learn how the dishwasher worked. She loved taking things apart and putting them all back together. She actually didn't have the option of doing science in primary school because it wasn't a subject at the time. Her parents, however, fostered her love of electronical engineering and her mum was a bookkeeper who encouraged a love of maths and accounting in her. When she was 10, she joined the Scouts and became a leader when she was 18. For her leaving cert, she did chemistry and physics, but there were actually only three girls studying physics in her year. In 2001, Bird started a degree in applied physics in Dublin City University, or DCU as we call it, with the plan to become an astrophysicist. She was just one of two women on her course. After achieving some of the top grades in her class in her third year, she was able to go to Connecticut, which is in America, for a semester of university. Here, she discovered that while she still had an incredible interest in space and would love to be an astronaut, she realized that astrophysics wasn't exactly what she had thought it would be, which shows us that it's totally okay to change your mind. She started her fourth year not really knowing what path she wanted to follow, but she knew that she still really loved hands-on experiments and space and light. 
Her final year project in fourth year was to look at tracking the sun to study solar flares. Following this, Bird applied for the FOSS Space Science Challenge, which saw 18 Irish students go to Florida in America to work on a project with the Florida Space Authority and NASA for three months. It was here at the Applied Physics Lab in NASA that Bird was given the advice that in order to follow a path in that area that she should do a PhD. So when we go to school, we do primary school, we do secondary school, we can go then to university and then after university you can get a master's and then you go to a PhD. So a PhD is the top degree you can get. So when she returned to Ireland, she attended a showcase of PhD topics in DCU. And the one that piqued her interest was in the area of biosensors and how a person can detect cancer earlier, which is super helpful for all of us. Bird now works as an education and public engagement manager at Insight at the Science Foundation Ireland Research Centre for Data Analytics. Here, there's a wide range of people working with different specialties, working on many different projects in many different areas. As public engagement manager, it's Bird's job to show these projects to the public and demonstrate the cutting edge and wonderful research that's going on in Ireland to the world. She also tries to bring the public into research projects. So if there is a project based around smart cities, she encourages co-design and talking to people in those cities to ensure the project is meeting all the concerns and worries of the people living in those areas. Bird continues to do a lot of outreach and helping young people and parents regarding the importance of studying science in school. In particular, she is trying to improve the number of girls taking on science subjects. Through being involved in scouting and doing a lot of activities outside of school, the possibility of being the only girl in science class wasn't a challenge for her. And she recognises that for some people, it's a complete moot point, which means it's unimportant. But for other people, it's a challenge. And that's the worry. And that maybe those people won't choose science because they'll feel lonely and alone in it. When talking to students, she often showcases or shows us the research being done by women in the field of science and points out that it is possible and it's a good idea to merge your own personal passions with a career in science like she has done. So there we have it, three Irish women in science. Now, I am a woman. I have been talking about science, so I'm going to be a woman of science now. And we are going to do a fun little experiment ourselves here. Put your time at home to good use and carry out little experiments and keep your curiosity alive. So what I have is a freezer bag. I have some very sharp pencils and I have two jugs of water. Now, this is an experiment called the magic bag. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to fill my bag with water. Now, it's helpful if you have someone to help you because sometimes it can take more than two hands. There's my first jug of water, Imaha. That is my second jug of water finished. Now, I am going to seal it shut. And you can know it's shut because it kind of makes li lovely little clicks and clips. Very satisfying. Now, right, my bag of water is full. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hold this up. And I bet you that I can pierce this bag with this pencil and not spill a drop of water. Do you think I can do it? Let's find out. Here we go. I made the pencil go right through. Now, why don't I try a second pencil? There we go. And look at that. 
a second pencil gone through. Now, I'm going to keep adding pencils. And if you want to try this at home, why don't you see just how many pencils you can pierce the bag with? Now, I want you to try this at home and I want you to send in your theories or your hypotheses on why the water doesn't leak. I can't wait to hear your ideas. So there you have it. We did history today and we were talking about the role of Irish women in science. We learned about Kathleen Yardley. We learned about Shikemi Danuga. We learned about Dr. Bird. I would love to see your own little pieces of research and projects on other fabulous Irish women in science. So please send anything like that into us. We would love to have a look at it. I also got the chance to be an Irish woman doing science today. So I hope that you try to recreate that experiment at home and start asking questions and remember to always stay curious. I hope that you enjoyed learning all about the women and their hard work and passion. And I hope that it, this is going to inspire some future scientists out there. And remember this, even if you're not a girl, this is an important lesson for you because when we lift women up and support them, we all benefit from it. Equality is so good for each and every one of us. So go out there and make a difference. And if you're interested in learning more, you can watch Who's Your Heroine on RTE. Slán! Laura Geraldine Lennox was a suffragette, an activist, a prisoner, a hero, and my great-great-granddad. This is a little bit of her story.